Welcome back to PGL Tavern Tales here in Bucharest. We are back with the second match for today. It will be again RDU because he, uh, he won his first match against Ikop with me, Nimsh and Raven again. We're Actually, we're only the three casters here for the event. Yeah, yeah, we are the only ones, but uh, we'll have players casting with us, mm -hmm. so it's not like uh, you guys will see all of us all the you time. You don't have to put it with us all the time, basically. <laughs> we'll, we'll mix it up later, so you know you don't have to look at our faces. Maybe constantly. we'll have RDU as well, and then Reddit will go full, you know. Oh, we'll go full, rap, full rap Reddit, <laughs> full Reddit riot <laughs> with uh, you know, with all the RDU best hate. caster. But yeah. Well, uh, you can see the um, bracket for Group B that we are playing right now. Super JJ lost to Tessin, 1-3, to three, so an expected result. The underdog won his match, and now we'll be facing RDU. So we'll see what, hi what, his, what is his strategy, because this is what excites me about this, um, this format, is the fact that we don't know who will be playing what. Yeah, and I think as well we saw from uh, Adu's interview that he is very confident in the way he's built his lineup, the mm -hmm. way he's got his strategies sorted out. He said he's got eight or nine different strategies based on exactly what his opponent does at any given time in the uh, pick and ban phase. And also, it would be great to see if he, he pulls out a similar strategy or whether Tessin picks something completely different, which then yep. alters everything uh, Adu decides. So it'd be cool to see how that works out. And as you said, good to see how Tessin approaches this format because I agree it's the most interesting part of this, uh, seeing how each player is really going to move into this format and what they can make of it. One more thing I like really like about this event is how close are the players against each other. Like they're <laughs> playing on one barrel, basically, because the, the, the table is a barrel, um, but they're so close to each other they c that it affects your mindset, right? You can look into each other's yes. eyes. Yes, I like would love to talk to a player that I'm playing against, but uh, in this setup, it's actually not, not possible because they have to ha uh, to wear um, headsets white with nose. white nose because otherwise they would have been able to hear us. We uh, have yeah. we have the bands, guys. So, warrior band. Oh, is are you banning actually a druid? No, it's Tess and yeah, it's Tess and band the druid. druid. So it's interesting. The first bands. Is Warrior from RDU, which we saw the in the previous match, uh, but Tessin banned the Druid, which is very interesting because that left open the Warrior. But even with that fa uh, with that fact, RDU chose to first pick his Shaman instead. Which means that Tessin then goes to ban the Warrior, and he bans the Rogue instead of Warlock or um, Shaman was already picked. All right, so yes. he, he decides basically for Rogue instead of Warlock or Priest. And the fun fact is, Priest was not banned, and RDU didn't pick the Priest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, again, this just sort of backs up what RDU's been saying, in that based on what his opponent actually picks, then we'll just completely alter, you know, whichever strategy he's planned out to go for. Because as we can see, that you know, as you said, that the Rogue pick has probably had a huge impact on the lack of Priest. I, I think that the fact that there's no Temple Mage this time, uh, push RDU to play a different class than Priest. Although there's a Hunter as well in this lineup. But I feel like the Priest is in, in uh, primary f to counter the, the Temple Mages, right? So because that's, I feel like that's the uh, majority of the Mages that we'll see during the tournament. Most people will tend to go for that aggressive lineup with the Mage, then Freeze Mage, which can be really awkward in a metagame where actually Paladin is being played. And priest can also be played with the infinite Hunters, amount of heals. Also right? good versus versus freeze mage. Yes. So freeze mage is dangerous. There's a lot of classes that have so much archetypes to be <laughs> like picked from, but uh, in general, it's very interesting to see what kind of ban strategy for each each, pl each player will be applied. And so far, we have a really um, well, let's say mixed classes in all the matches. Right? Are do you? played Priest and Mage in his previous match, and now he doesn't have neither of those. Yeah, Shaman, Warlock, and Paladin. And uh, Tessin also is playing Rogue, so uh, this is a class that we haven't seen in many tournaments recently, being one of the worst classes right now next to Priest. Uh, but yeah, Rogue it is, and uh, we already see Questing Adventure. Yeah. Well, we'll start with the first match between Tess and RDU. The Rogue versus the Paladin. Paladin seems to be ultra-aggressive, so I'll leave you guys to it. Have fun with the game. Thanks so much, Lothar. So this is really cool already because um, one, uh, I was going to talk about the quest and adventure rogue, but this but paladin, this is paladin yeah, as well, this right? Paladin's so just, so just what do we talk about? Eye. What do we talk about okay, first? Rogue, so 
Paladin? We'll go Paladin. All right, let's talk Paladin. One. So you so talk, talk about Paladin, I will okay, pick up Rogue. So already, I think Ardu is going to be feeling pretty happy against lining up against the Rogue uh, for the first one with this Paladin. I'm pretty sure Tessin more than likely won't be expecting an aggressive list. We've seen so much Enerfin, so much, uh, so many like Zoth Enerfin decks, you know, late game Paladins, and even a splash of, say, you know, like Dragon uh, Paladin has been, people have been messing around with a little bit. But this hyper aggro list, anything that's this aggressive almost always performs very well versus Rogue because you just get that permanent damage on there. Rogue doesn't normally play any heals. Used to be a day where they played Farseers, but even that normally isn't well enough. Played. And Tessin, you can already see him. <laughs> you can already see him just laugh as Adu puts down the wall gun and Tessin's like, oh, I okay. I do I do agree with it because you normally do expect those Murlocs as you mentioned. And uh, this deck is also a viable choice, but uh, an unexpected one and specifically versus Rogue. So so Rogue, Questing Adventure is, uh, is a fine addition. It, if it was being played before as well. It's a, it's like another Edwin in a way, and some decks just uh, can't interact with the card. Yeah, well th enough. there are actually just a lot of times if you get Quest Adventure down with Conceal, you almost just win off the back of that because not a lot of classes can just straight up deal with a concealed minion, especially because Questing's more than likely going to be three plus at that point. So cards like Consecrate don't deal with it. And also, like, the damage that the rogue can then follow up with the next turn. We're playing so many cards, which is pretty much what they excel at, uh, being able to hit so hard with the quest. And we've seen ga uh, we've seen uh, games be decided by huge questing turns into Van Cleave Conceal, and then, like, your opponents just, what, what do they even do to deal with that? But yeah, I don't know if questing's going to be so good in this matchup. We're going to see Tessin try and do everything he can to stave off this kind of aggression he might from go RDU. He might go for Edwin here. Uh, because, uh, and he's going all in. Yeah, he's doing he has to, he has to. So there's a couple of things. First, there was a big choice for RDU, a life tap or a fire blast. He did not take life tap. Uh, there is this one card that's really big in this matchup, which is Divine Favor. You, you use it to uh, uh, fill your hand. And normally Ro has a lot of cards. With this play, Tessin is playing around Divine Favor, specifically after life tap was not taken by RDU. So really nice play. But the problem for Tessin is that there is this Keeper of Uldaman that will be able to deal with the Edwin next turn. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, Tessin's going to be able to get one hit uh, out of this Van Cleef before it's reduced down to a 3-3. But the problem there is there's no great follow-up to actually kill the Van Cleef. So even though it's reduced, it can still get some work done as... It It'll, it'll just alter Tessin's plans a little bit where he uses the Van Cleef in a more defensive manner instead of, at this point, you would just go face three mm. times and try and win. Um, but yeah, it is going to be changed up a little bit with this Keeper of Alderman. So very fortunate that RDU has access to the Keeper so early on. Because if he didn't, like, what does he... He can't, he can't race a 10-10. Do like, you play... Close. Yeah, yeah, you definitely not race the 10-10. But uh, do you play Alders in this list? Like, um, because I think uh, the Agro Paladin right now has a lot of versions. Like, I've even seen one with Moras. Mm. Um, I think Aldo's too slow for the list. Might the, be, yeah. Yeah, because Keeper's a uh, benefit because, one, you can reduce the health down of taunt minions. You also so play Steward in that slot. Yeah, so you can reduce the health down of taunt minions, which helps you get through them. And also, you can just buff a 1-1, which then makes the bodies bigger and be more aggressive in that fact. So, you know, the keep has multiple uses, whereas Aldo is just a little bit slow. It's not going to help do too much. You need to be super aggressive. Um, and you can see Ardu does play the Keeper, reduce the Van Cleef down to a 3-3, and now it's much less threatening, and the health totals are actually equal for both sides. Yeah, they are equal, and Tessin right now has an initiative. Uh, two Pillager, also on the turn 5, he will have that nice Azure Drake. He kept his hand to a minimum passively, so the Divine Favor will not be that strong if it shows up. There's no uh, Divine Favor, though. Dragon Egg, something that would, will make one European player very happy. Yep. Jambre does like his eggs. Yeah, he does play that egg paladin. But um, honestly, Dragon Egg is a pretty fine addition to this deck here uh, because you have so many uh, cards that actually buff. I believe Defender of Argus might be also in this deck. Like yeah, and I, I imagine the usuals, like uh, Blessing of Kings, for example, is yeah. a key one. Even Blessing of Might isn't unexpected, so you can normally get pretty good value from this. Uh, it looks like RDU is going to put the Tomb Pillager down to 3 health, so it can't trade very well into the Keeper, which is really nice while still piling pressure on. So sort of a in-between option there. Not killing the Tomb Pillager, but setting it up for a much easier kill going forward, as he does even have Abusive onto the Egg if he you know, really feels the need to trade into it next turn. But now we do have a Conceal mm. for Tessin, so this is something you've mentioned, uh, the... Adventure with Conceal might be very good here, yep. and uh, that's what Stessen is going to do. Uh, he is trading though instead of going to face, so he doesn't feel like racing yet.
but uh, he should be able to protect his 5-1 with this. Yeah, I, I like this as well, because it means he can choose the trade for the 5-1, and then he gains the coin to Gadgets and Coin next turn, if he feels he needs to. Depending on what his draw is, of course, it's not like a 100% go-to play. Um, and on RDU's side here, he doesn't really have too many options. Argent Protector, you're mm. going to uh, more than likely see on the 3-4, as you want the egg to actually get damaged to be able to start spawning the 2-1 dragons. But I wouldn't be too surprised if he just played the uh, Argent Protector ping. And I think You can ping the egg, actually. Yeah, yeah. Start, start with that, because it just creates a 2-1 on board. And yeah. uh, you I'm probably just will get wondering whether you hold the abusive to get the egg value or whether you just throw it all down this turn, because the egg could trade next turn with abusive, yeah. but also a fan of knives makes the egg a, p a pain for the rogue, right? It's so you don't really want to use up the zero one that's left on the egg. I'm not sure that egg is that valuable right now. I would say that the more valuable thing will be to try to race and win the game as fast mm -hmm. as possible before you're overwhelmed by this questing adventure. Mm -hmm. Like, obviously, fan of knives is going to be deadly for you, but do you have enough resources to actually play around Final of Knives at this point. Yeah, I mean, I actually just like the abusive and, and just put the five damage in. You're, uh, you're more than likely running cards like Leroy, maybe even Argent Commander in this deck for some damage from hand, and there's the Final Knives. about the devil. <laughs> yeah. But what this does is it means that if it's going to play Fan, it's going to more than likely force like a hero power out, but it will depend on what Tessin gets from the Fan. You can actually clear quite nicely here mm -hmm. if you attack with the questing adventure into an egg and then uh, and even coin out drake as well if he uh, you know after after the train oh no i'm being stupid no he can't no, you can't, you, you, you can't. can't find the knives as well but i was, I was it's still early nymph it's still early i was actually thinking about not taking damage with questing adventure so i well with this he's actually taking less damage on himself so maybe that makes sense um oh. The question, the question would be, do you want to be at 10 and have a 4-4 four, four questing adventure, or do you want to be at 12 and have a 4-4 a four, four adventure? I think because RDU's on such a low card count, like low hand size, and even a Divine Favor wouldn't do tons this turn, because it is 3 out of the 7 mana he would have available to him anyway, is the, you're probably not too worried that even if the quest adventure gets killed and traded into, well, again, that's you know more health for you, and you have Gadget Zan plus Coin next turn to, to start doing some weird stuff and start cycling through, and maybe make more of an impact. And we're going to see now what Tessin actually chooses to. This is a bit of a tricky turn. Here's your Drake. So no Gadgets and Shenanigans quite yet. This allows him to get the SI off, so this is really nice. Yeah, it makes sense. Like, uh, he would still be able to do the SI with the Tomb Pillager. He just decides for Asterix first to get the card. And uh, yeah, this is this is big because RDU, the only card that can actually give him something will be Divine Favor. Maybe maybe Terry and Rallying Blade is... Oh, that's just game. That's that's it, yeah. He can't do anything with this Rallying Blade in his hand. So he just ran out of resources and Destin's taking this first one with the Rogue. That fan of knives came at just the right time because that would have been a little bit more tricky to deal with if the fan of knives wasn't drawn there, being able to clear up so many of the minions uh, early on. Because other other than that, Tessin was actually under a lot of pressure. That combined with the uh, quest adventure not being able to get cleared up was actually super important there. I think like from the beginning of the match, actually, the decision from Tessin to, to go for a big Edwin and just uh, empty his hand in case there is divine favor, just get this big guy on the board and say like, hey, do you have removal for that? Already you had some kind of a response, not really full removal, because the free free admin was still going to do some some work. And uh, with the Blade Flurry nerf some time ago, a Rogue lost a lot of AoE potential, but this fan of knives is still there and it's still rocking. Yep, and we are going into the next game now, and it is going to be RDU picking his Shaman into Tessin's Rogue. And as we can see with Doomhammer Lava Burst, we imagine this is an aggressive list, not too much of a surprise at all. And this, is, again, is a bit of a worry because Tessin probably didn't expect the Paladin to be aggro, right? But now, so he Tessin's picked Rogue into aggro Paladin and, like, aggro Shaman. So these are both not great matchups. The Shaman's probably, you know, probably going to get a pretty easy win here unless something goes terribly wrong if you know maybe there's a giant van cleef early on again but rdu is going to be feeling pretty confident again this is last hero standing which is why testing is still on his road and how do you get to like almost counter pick into him yeah he just has to keep um keep his deck and also i want to mention that the winner of this this game this match is going forward to, to tomorrow to the top eight because this is the winner's match. Uh, they both won uh, RDU versus Ecop and Tessin versus Super JJ. Uh, and this matchup is normally really one-sided, especially with the opening leg RDUs. When, when you go Totem Golem turn one with one dropped in two, 
it's really tough to win. Yeah, prep is actually a really, really good pick up here for testing because you need the cards that allow you to do ridiculous things. You know, early on, you need the backstabs, the SIs, the preps, and some early removal just to be able to slow down the shame. And as we see, Adi, you going straight that, into Tuska is actually that's pretty concerning. decent. Is it going to be totem goal? And that's the question. Yes, oh it is. Of course it is. Oh my goodness! Look, so not only he got it uh, specifically in that uh, in that mana slot, he also is getting the totem goal. I, lo I love the differences in the face. Tessin just, you know, Tessin's actually a super like cheerful guy. He always seems happy when I see him, and uh, you know, he's sort of just laughing about it. And Adi, he's just got a slight smile on his face, like, yeah, sorry, but not sorry. Yeah, this is this is tough for Destin. Not only a bad matchup, but you are having an uphill battle. And uh, Destin, you know, he is cheerful and happy, but I've seen him dream hack when uh, the things they don't go his way, he can get pretty upset. So okay. his mindset I probably still needs some work. Unless he maybe he's just always happy to see me. Maybe uh, that's probably why. yeah, probably yeah. I'm <laughs> not really happy to see Totem Golem from the Tasker Totemic. Uh, what is the play here? Because if you go for the flame flame rift faceless, you can get a sap, and there might not be a sap. If there is no sap, it's great. You've seen the sh uh, Shadow Strike, so it will be really hard to deal 7 damage to the to this minion. But if there is a sap, not only you just lose your turn, you also lose 2 mana crystals for the next turn. Yeah, I think, especially when you have options like this, you have Flamesome Totem, another Totem Golem, uh, even Maelstrom Portal, if you really want to do that to clear the Thanos up instead, and to create a, a minion as well. I think the, the Flame Wreath is one of the options that you can take where things can go terribly wrong. Like you said, the sap would be a real problem. Whereas I think there are so many of the better options. I like the Totem Golem somewhere, and then either Hero Power or even Maelstrom just to clear off the Thanos. He is going to go for the Flame Wreath, so yeah, he's choosing the high risk, high reward option yeah, the here. The situation was really awkward because normally you kind of want to go wide versus Rogue, but if there is this spell damage on board, you, you don't. Yeah. So you have to trade your free two into the 1 1 or like just kill it. But uh, then you're losing damage, and what you really want to do in this matchup is just keep dealing damage. Uh, don't want to give time to your opponent because maybe they'll have those crazy gadgets in turn and actually come back. But if you just go face, at some point you will have enough damage to just finish them off. Yeah, it's interesting as well. We see the South Sea deckhand in Tessin's uh, deck, which is not something that's been too common as of late. I think a lot of the rogue decks have been very all in on the quest adventurers and just the raw draw the drawing potential that the rogue deck has with gadgets and auctioneer in there. So. So an interesting one just to have a minion down there. It's going to get cleared up by a Maelstrom portal, pretty straightforward, and gets the young Dragonhawk. So I believe. Also, not too bad. Yeah, the Dragonhawk is, is cool. It's going to die to the weapon, though, but uh, I think like Tessin did cut Violet Teachers then. If he's playing Questing Adventure, if he's playing um, Deckhand, you, you yeah, just something have needs to, to cut something. Yeah, something needs to stop somewhere. Conceal for the gadgets, and though, along with that prep, is looking really nice for Tess in here. Is at least he's still behind on health. Wow, okay, hang on. Uh, so, with double lava burst, <laughs> yeah, 14, suddenly double lava burst 15. changes everything. Yeah, this is still so much damage. Okay, so the idea here for Adi is he's going to refill the board. He's already seen one sap, and he's going to rely on the fact that the damage he gets in from the trog and going a little bit wide on the board, as you said earlier means that he can finish up in a turn or two with the Lava Burst and maybe even the Flame Tongue if a minion survives this turn. Can you kill everything here? If you go for Astrake, you can backstab the 4-3, you mm -hmm. can attack in the 3-4, and then 7-7 seven, seven is a problem. You can't deal with it, so... Oh, uh, this is awkward. You can backstab and eviscerate the 7-7, seven, seven, but then the Chalk survives. So you will have to pick up another backstab, I believe. Yeah, this is tough. It's going to be Gadget Zen from the Azure Drake, so I guess he just leaves the Totem Golem up this turn. Unless he gets a backstab. Um, this is this was the first backstab, right? Uh, I think so, yeah. If he will get a second backstab, he can then clear the board. Didn't manage it, though. And that will be it, uh, or not yet. This nope, is he has seven. one more turn. 7 plus 4, 11, yeah, all right. One, one damage off. But pretty much, like we said, Rogue doesn't normally run too many heals. And uh, Adi, you just has the second lava burst available to him for the next turn. So. Yeah, but on the other hand, can you actually not kill the gadget? I guess you're not dying because this is nine it damage on board, nineteen. Yeah, I think it would be surprising if you didn't die, unless now he chooses to just go for ping. He can just ping and then kill off the gadget Zan and then just double lava burst next turn with the attack from the trog guarantees it as well. So you could choose to just play really safe here, which I wouldn't mind at all. And that's what Adi is going to do. Play it safe, get the 4 damage in. It's extremely unlikely that this rogue deck will heal outside of like, double lava burst range, so especially pretty good about this. Especially with so many cards like Questing Adventure and uh, 
you normally don't expect far series. Exactly. Maybe yeah. one and, far series. And also, all I'd use doing here is just you think about how, in, in the smallest chance ever, how do I lose this game? And Gadgetzan staying alive is one of those outs for somehow that Tessin could do something yeah, quite yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. But it just removes that as an option, and now we can see pretty much a formality now. Tessin's going to do what he can to try and survive and set up well, from question Tessin's, again. From Tessin's perspective, he's not dead yet. Like He hopes there is not, not more damage, and maybe this questing adventure will win him the game. So he's still hopeful that uh, the Shaman will not have 8 damage in hand, but we know it. He knows that double Lava Burst is enough to finish the game, and uh, Titus did his match. Yeah, nothing too surprising at all. Uh, RDU does even up 1-1 one, one with the Shaman versus the Rogue. And like I said, when you've got... Uh, we're not sure what his Warlock deck is, of course, but when you have, you know, Aggro Shaman and the Aggressive Paladin list, then you're feeling pretty confident when you hit that Rogue deck. But that's just the Rogue deck, and Rogue deck is, a Rogue deck is no more uh, in this in this match because it got eliminated this last year standing. So now RDU has to stay with his Aggro Shaman instead of Midrange Shaman that's uh, more and more popular on ladder nowadays. Yeah. Um, and Tess needs to pick one of his decks that, that, that he capped. So what's left for Tess? Like, he... He picked Druid, I believe, as his first. I know he banned Druid. He has he Hunter Druid. and Shaman left. Oh, Hunter and Shaman. Okay, so he has his own Shaman. We can already see this is the mid-range version I've mentioned. Uh, Spirit Claws, really nice card. Um, more often better than Fireworks. One mana cheaper, one more durability. Speaking of which, there's one in the hand of testing now. I think that Spirit Claws was a bit of a sleeper card, at least for me, for Karazhan. Um, I didn't expect it to be as good as it is. But yeah, it's, uh, it's swiftly becoming a staple in, in most Shaman decks now. We see it get equipped turn one. Nothing too crazy. This means his Tunnel Trog doesn't just get blown out by a Rock Biter or something. So it looks like RDU has put in a, a tech card himself with the Crazed Alchemist. So interesting choice there. I believe that he may be expected... Well, Crazed Alchemist. So if you feel like you are going to play a lot of Mirrors, it's really good versus Totems. It's really good versus Doomsayer. And Doomsayer is a card that's being played in Paladin, in, in the Freeze Mage. Mm -hmm. So so it makes sense. But overall, again, a very good opening for RDU. Uh, Totem Golem, turn one, turn two, he has a follow-up. And uh, in this match, I believe there is a slight advantage for Tessin. At least historically, Midrange Shaman had a slight advantage versus Agro Shaman. Getting a nice Totem there. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. Puts the Golem to one. It's got to feel pretty nice. And yeah, the the mid-range variant, as long as it doesn't get steamrolled super early, because it normally runs Lightning Storms, maybe just two Maelstroms and uh, one Lightning Storm Yeah. nowadays, is, is, I guess, the general build. But as long as you can just completely wipe out the board early enough, because the second the Aggro Shaman gets minion damage early and then just ends the game with spells, that's when you're in uh, trouble because you can't do enough damage quick enough as the mid-range list. But it's looking, it's looking okay for Tessin so far. We'll see what he gets. Just the 1-1 one, one of the Siren Totem. So the thing about the Shaman shaman Mirrors that uh, before with Aggro Shamans it was all about trading the board because of those AoEs and stuff. Uh, you normally don't have heal, but you do have taunts. You have things from below. So if if the trading goes on, Midrange Shaman normally should have more ways to deal with stuff. Also, uh, with double hex, the Midrange Shaman has a good answer to the uh, Flame Rift Faceless. Yeah. So it is better equipped to deal with the board situations, but as you mentioned, if Agro Shaman can actually just go for face, it can maybe just win for that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what the deck does, right? And you can see now Tessin has a few options here. The problem is putting just double Tunnel Trog down in Hero Power might not feel too great. It's definitely going to rely on what Hero Power he gets, okay. So he didn't get the Spell Power, so he can't kill off his opponent's Trog, but... He can kill the Totem. I guess he's pretty much running out of options here. The Trogs represent enough of a threat for RDU to have to stop and think about, whereas, you know, if, if RDU has to AoE clear this somehow or try and clear these Trogs, then Tessin's happy because the game's continuing without any real more damage to yeah, his Yeah, trading face. works for Tessin. Yeah. Tessin's like, sure, let's continue trading till you run out of cards and I just bring my mana to Totems. But uh, RDU has options here, so what is the best the best way? Lava Burst already to deal with both Trogs. And he can still play even the Arjun Squire, which will work pretty well with the Flame Tongue Totem next turn. Yeah, we see that Adu's uh, sort of gradually running Ooh. out of resources now. The Crazy Alchemist, other than killing off a totem, isn't going to get tons done. Um, not as valuable um, the way this match is going, at least. Look at that. Think from below for one mana. He's dealing with the troll. Seems like a pretty good card. Yeah, especially after we've seen Lava Burst. So this is already getting tougher Ooh. and tougher for 
for RDU. Yeah, the, the issue is there's no great way to deal with this board. He can Crazed Alchemist the uh, Flame Tongue Totem to reduce the damage down, but that does nothing versus the thing from below at all. If he goes for Tasker to Tammy, does it change anything? Not really. I don't think so. I think you might have to Alchemist this turn, like take the reduced damage, and then try and get Flame Tongue off next turn to get some good trades in, because you should still have the shield on the Arch of Squire. <laughs> to be able to like bank on it next turn, but he's just going to play the Tusk guy. <laughs> Mana Tide is actually pretty good for RDU. It's exactly what he needs. He just needs like bare answers to the board state, and additional card draw is always going to help with that. All right. I'm curious about this Varns, because I haven't seen many Varns in the Shaman deck, so what is there that it can actually bring? And Mana Tide Totem. Yeah, there's actually a surprising amount of like decent targets. Even like Tunnel Trogs are actually okay because they still gain the damage. If you get a uh, Thunder Bluff, that's still great, especially if you can Hero Power the same turn to true, just get the instant true. value. There's e Flame Tongue Totem. You know, th there's actually a lot of cards that benefit from Barnes quite quite easily in this mid range list. I like the inclusion because sometimes you know whatever people may think of Barnes in terms of how they enjoy it in the competitive sense, like a lot of the times he just pulls you exactly what you need and mana time well, is definitely a huge help here. Most of the time it's not even such a big investment because you play a 3-4 for four, four, 4 mana which is bringing a 1-1 one, one. so stat wise it's a Yeti. It's a 4-5 in stats. Just yeah. split a 1-1 one, one and a 3-4 which is an okay deal. And uh, if Considering that's worst case scenario. Worst case scenario yeah. if you don't have Doomsayers in your deck. Yeah. So worst case scenario is just get a 1-1 one, one blank so you just got a Yeti for four, four mana. There are but best case, best case <laughs> like or like it a can win a game. A good case, yeah, definitely. There's so many good things you can get. And yeah. now there is the Lava Burst for RDU, so he can deal with the 7-5. And he can deal with the Totem. Like, he can actually have a pretty he nice turn here. Lava Burst... Clear everything but bonds. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly. And I think you should probably go for it. You can Lightning Bolt the 0-2, then uh, run the 1-1 one, one into the 1-1. One, one. Mm -hmm. I think he... It it's a good turn in terms of the amount of work he can get done, but it's actually uh, can be really awkward as well because he's using a lot of resources. He's actually going the, the other way. He's half half doing it, getting his own thing from below down with the flame tongue. So I was going to say what this does is if you use the lava burst lightning bolt, then like how does he realistically ever end this game if a lightning storm comes out? Yeah, he's he already used one of the lava bursts, so he's running out of the spell burst he even has available to him. So Adi's just going like the, you know, the halfway house here, clearing what he can and representing the board himself that now Tessin has to deal with. But we saw that the Lightning Storm is there with the spell power as well. Let's see what kind of work this can do. Okay. Good enough. Yeah, easily good enough. I think the four, the, the four damage on the 5-5 five five was actually pretty good as well because you can then trade the totem. Yep. So that's a nice board that uh, that this Tessin is developing out. Can you go all in? You can probably go all in on those minions. Yeah, I think he does because the overload from the totem doesn't change the fact that he can't Thunder Bluff and Hero Power next turn anyway. Oh, he's, he's held he's off. He's playing okay. around AoEs, you know, because... Oh, yeah, but what, what AoEs? There's only real Maelstrom, right? Um, you can play one Storm as well in Agro Shaman. Depends, like, this is a different format. This is a new format, so you can't really know what, uh, what to expect from your opponent. And recently, in, uh, when like before Karazhan, people play double storms in Agro Shaman. Yeah. And I think I've seen more as a... Oh, second Thunder Bluff. Okay. So I guess this is the turn where you just play one. Like, why not? Like, yeah. you, your opponent's got no cards. It, it's, you use two Lava Bursts. So what's actually going to kill this it's guy? It's a 3-6. And, and then next turn, you play another one in Hero Power. So it seems pretty good. RDU now on the, the, the rough end of this game here with Sir Finley draw. Not going to do too much, and there we go. He's just, you know, pretty much seen how it's going to turn out. He's got so many overload that he could Finley hero power this turn, but it wasn't really going to be enough. And, and Tessin taking the game there, so he's going to be 2-1. Yeah, this is this was as anticipated again, because um, the, the mid range Shaman has just all the tools it needs to deal with the with the Agro Shaman. Unless Agro Shaman, as you mentioned, has this, this big start, but we haven't, even though there was an okay start from RDU, there were ways to deal with it. I think Spirit Claws did some really good work, just getting the totem early, getting damage on the totem golem, being able yeah. to just control the early game, and, and just force RDU also to trade into the minions. Like Lava Bursting Trox is like, sure, just waste your damage on my Trox, because you have to. Yeah, th there's really like, there was, there was no other way around it for RDU there, and I think Tessin getting the Lightning Storm when he did as well, and uh, even having the spell power to make the trades even stronger, it uh, really worked out for him. But we are into the next game. It's, of course, going to be Tessin's Midrange Shaman versus what appears to be RDU Zulith. So yeah. RDU probably want it 
you know, one of the decks he's most known for. I think he's played a hell of a lot of Zoo in his time. Um, multiple variants, of course. And now we're going to see some of the newer cards like the Malkazar's Imp. I'm excited. I'm excited. Silverware Golem as well, so there could be some crazy discard shenanigans going on today. I want to see what version is he playing, really, what cards he playing, li a librarian as well, and how is he going to discard the cards if he hits. Because I played a bit of the zoo, and uh, the deck is really cool, but sometimes you just get so unlucky with, this, with the 50-50s. Yeah, I think as well, um, um, what happened when Karazhan was sort of finished and all the cards were accessible is everyone went crazy on discard. And then, as always, the mechanic was like within Zoo was cut down, cut down, cut down. So I think there's mainly just Doomguard and Soulfires in a lot of lists. Librarians sort of appear now and again. But I do like the fact that Adi was playing Count Summon because a lot of people were cutting that card in the discard lists. Yeah. And I just think the card is way too good to cut. Even when you're not running um, Forbidden Ritual, for example, you just the card is just an instant threat. Even as a 1-5, it can just be cause so much trouble for your opponent that it just is a guaranteed play. Uh, but at even least on my end. Even though even though the deck is cool and all, I feel like here Shaman will have an advantage because uh, normally Zul was really good versus Agro Shamans and the Midrange Shaman, but right now with the Maelstrom portal, so you have more AoE effects because you run Maelstrom and you have Lightning Storms, you, ha you have a better position. But I'm also surprised about this Feral Spirit here because I would normally go for Tusker Totemic on the clear board. Do not overload yourself. Just having only one mana next turn is not the best option, I believe. What do you think about it? Yeah, I think I think it's okay just because the Feral Spirits trade a lot better normally than um the, than the Tuscar. If Tuscar Totemic just gets you know, healing totem or something, then it's a bit you know a, a bit of undervalue. But with the with the weapon down as well and having the Tunnel Trog available for that one mana, I think it was okay in the long run. I think um, he just filled out his curve quite nicely. And having the weapon makes the trades much more likely. And it does work for him right now because he was able to protect that truck with those stones and now place another first spirit, building up his board even more. And uh, this discard zoo, as we call it, does not really have AoE effects. So okay. is Doomguard is, time. Is this the world we live in where RDU plays Doomguard and discards the Imp and the other Doomguard? <laughs> it might happen. Like, uh, honestly, that I played a bit of this deck or this style. And too often this situation happened to me, so I stopped for a while. I took a break and went back to good old Reno luck. And that oh! happened. Oh, okay. My that is worst case scenario by far. And is there is there an easy way for Tessin to clear this Doom Guard up? I mean, he does he have he, to? He, I so I think if Tessin just takes the approach of clear the board every single time versus Zoo, then how will Zoo ever win? Yeah, Zoo uh, will know, never win. It just win. doesn't. It, you just make sure the board is empty every single turn. Even though Tessin's quite pressured in terms of health on 15. It's fine. Like, what does Ardu you like? This every single time it's going to be difficult for Ardu to battle for this board back, especially when there's Thanos down. You've and seen you two already know. Yeah, You've exactly. There's, there's very limited burst potential left. And with the spell power, you already know Spirit Claws are going to hit for three next turn. So, you know, being able to trade really well there. You can, ex you can expect, actually. Um, Soul fires because the deck also yep. runs the fire double soul fire, but uh, but at you 15 you're still feeling very yeah, safe. Yeah, definitely fine, fires. and you are not expecting Leroy to show up at any point, Ooh. and probably no sea giants in this list as well. It's all about the discard. So the worst case uh, that can happen is maybe a golem will show up with the discard effect, and they're like, sure, with this board, I'm taking this. But this is just scary. Like you know, the, I really like the double Tuskai it gave him the most chances of getting totem golem. We do see a librarian in the list. That's so cool to see. They're uh, going to try and use it to discard the Silverware Golem, but yeah, Tessin's going nope. so wide and gets the Direwolf, and it, th this is... This is what this I is mentioned in the beginning, yeah. you know? This is the problem I had with this deck as yeah. well, because sometimes you have to go for 50-50s, and if you, don't, if you hit early, great. You can just kill your opponent super fast, because you, 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 do play, you cheat. You do plays that are not supposed well, to happen. To, to be honest, if the mechanic was more reliable, then it would be far too powerful. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> like, I do agree with you. Know, sometimes this does have to happen, and Tessin, even having the Lightning Storm early on, just to seal the deal here, I would be very surprised, and it looks like RDU has conceded. Not much way out there, and Tessin does take the victory 3-1 over RDU in a you know, pretty convincing fashion with that mid-range shame, and he took the win versus the aggro variant from uh, RDU, and then pretty straightforward win versus the Zoo. RDU got 
quite unlucky there, I think, with, you know, with the discards being as awkward as they could possibly be. Uh, it got a little bit too much for him there and just couldn't ever get the board back after double Toscar Totem. Yeah, Lothar is with us. Um, that yep. was a, a very interesting match, Lothar. What, what do you think? Maybe, was there anything in the in the deck picks that maybe didn't work for you in the end? <laughs> to be honest, when you don't have the full image of everyone's lineup, I think you can't really say that someone made a bad choice mm. in, the, in the pick and ban, right? There's so much to consider in this format that I think that the players have the, the best way to, to explain it, right? And here we have limited knowledge when, when it comes to all the decks that are bringing. So uh, what we can judge is how the match is being played, but not how the players are being, you know, if they're being picking and banning correctly. Because that's so much, it's so much information that is needed. I just realized something awesome, guys, which is uh, also really bad, but it's awesome. Here we so go. We have I'm, I'm worried already. We have, <laughs> we have group B. Testing goes through. This means that Ecop, RDU, Super JJ, only one of those guys can actually go through. Yeah, it's is that be awesome? crazy. <laughs> I mean, that's well, it, that's it, awesome. I mean to, to be fair, in a tournament this stacked, this is going to happen in every single group, right? Like, yeah, that's literally true. anyone that's true. can go through the group. There's no one that's going to be too unexpected. The qualified players are both very mm -hmm. good players as well, so wouldn't be too much of a surprise. And like I said, in a tournament with every single group is stacked, there's always going to be some upsets. I need to cut you off because we'll be watching the best plays of the match, presented by HP, our sponsor of the event. So let's see what was happening during those games and let's uh, talk this through. This was the first match uh, between the Agro Paladin and Rogue uh, when the miraculous Fan of Knives showed up and wrecked and, and a pretty big Van Cleef as well. So we actually uh, have Tessin with us as well. So how surprised were you that it was Agro Paladin? Uh, like the thing is, I know at you and I played against him three times on ladder in a row and the two first times he just instantly conceded then he was playing Paladin. So I knew it was something special. Okay. And then we actually played the third game, and I knew that he was going to bring Paladin okay. aggro. Not sure if Tessin's mic was actually on there. <laughs> so, uh, well, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see in the <laughs> next, next occasion. This is the um, aggro Shaman versus Rogue. A pretty straightforward match, I would say, that most of the time you just lose because Rogue has no way of um, stopping yeah, the I think, attacks. I think it was right? very like, textbook. If you had to describe how that matchup should go, it went pretty straightforward there. I we yeah. see the uh, the joy of the discards from RDU. Well, congrats on advancing from the group, Tessen. Uh, that is actually quite a feat. You're now in day two. Uh, can you tell us something about how you prepared for this tournament? How uh, were you expecting to go through a group? Of course you were, but what what, what were your your thoughts about the tournament? For real, like I know it's a really hot tournament and there's a lot of good players, but. I was feeling really confident when I saw my group because I know that they're really good players, but I also play a lot. But I know how they play. They really don't know much about me. And after I saw the group, I know that they were playing a lot of aggro. So I, w I was really sure what I was going to pick and let Warlock be open because I know that it was Sue letting them pick Shaman because I know that I would win the mirror. They, and I okay. prepared a lot by looking at my opponents as well as my own decks. So so what was um, what was with the rogue pick then? Because if you're expecting a lot of like you know fast aggro, like rogue normally doesn't fare too well versus that. But it was your second pick, I believe. Yep. In the lineup. So what what made you take rogue versus what you expected RDU to be able to pick? It, it was for sure a really hard one. But I was like, okay, I just need to not screw up with my shaman. Like my shaman can beat both of his decks. So I was like, okay, I picked two different decks now, so I'm sure that I can beat no matter whatever he got. Like, we, I saw his last games against Ecop. He was playing Dragon Priest. Yeah. So I was really not sure what to expect Expect for the two uh, aggro decks. But he didn't ban the Priest, and he didn't pick the Priest. Nah, it was fine, because I had Honda last, so I could beat his uh, Priest deck. And what's up with the Rogue deck? Because you're playing uh, a bit of an awkward build, let's say, with Questing Adventure and Deck Hand. Yeah, I... I actually found out myself like the deck, and then I pr I was uh, practicing with Sixo, and then he told me that, oh, you should probably try to switch like three cards out or something, and then we tested some games, and it worked out really good. All okay. Right. Well, it seems like a question of adventure made actually a comeback um, recently, like the last month, into the metagame. It was a joke that everyone, when someone in Twitch chat was asking, how can I replace Falnos and Edwin? In the deck, and now everyone's playing. Yeah, well, you can, play <laughs> you can play Kobold and a uh, Question Adventure, right? And now it's actually a card that is being played <laughs> as a meta game choice when you have both Edwin and like a staple of the deck as yeah, well. It's yeah. like it's, it's kind of crazy when you think about it that some cards from the core set of the game that were released three years ago 
they are, are now being suddenly staples. playable. It's yeah, like when we saw uh, Onyx, yeah. we saw it in a uh, Adi's deck as well, cra uh, the Crazed Alchemist. Yeah. So like you know that's just a card that wasn't used at all for the longest time. It went through you know uh, much more popularity a bit earlier on this year, where with a lot of freeze mage knocking around as well. But True. yeah, it um, seems pretty good so far. I'm actually happy that both uh, the World Champion cards like uh, Firebat and the uh, Priest of Feast are actually playable. <laughs> well, play okay. Priest will be playable in this tournament. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Yeah, but Priest event. of the Feast is a good card, actually. I yeah, I it is. It is. I, I agree about that. Uh, and it's something I feel like Priest might have been needed in the big picture, mm -hmm. but maybe it's not solving the problem yet of the class. But it's definitely something that will be used later uh, in the stages of, sure. of development. Uh, now we'll be preparing for the next match that will happen.